welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Katie Hirsch. I'm the director and chief curator at the Albany Institute of Contemporary Art. And I'm so excited to be introducing the fourth. Um, the, uh, the WGS intersection panel um, discussion. And so I'm going to turn it over to Chris Sewell, who organizes this event for us, uh, which has become quickly a staff favorite. I'm going to tell you now, we're not supposed to be my favorite, but we love this event. So thanks for being here and welcome so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for being here. I am director and professor of music and studies I'm here at the college. Uh, I want to thank Katie and Mark, um, especially Mark, for his patient persistence um, in our organizing these panels. Uh, and I really appreciate that. And also, just the team at the Hall Series. They're all amazing. Um, so I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks and introduce uh, panelists or the conversationalists, and um, I'll take it from there. So Clementine's work is perfectly suited for this WGS intersections um, theme because women's and gender studies reflects and interrogates the intersections of academic disciplines as well as our identities and positionalities. De La Paz brings us, Laurentio de La Paz brings us into the intersections of ancient craft and modern technology, of interiority and exteriority, of the human, the not human, and of the materiality or the haptic um, qualities of data that we so often perceive to be abstract or in the cloud. Uh, his work involves a language that emerges not from the human or the machine, the computer, but a hybrid language, what they have likened to the, to the ghost of the machine, where the unpredictable can happen. And so we're sitting in this like, space of unpredictability. Uh, Valencio offers, us, uh, offers to us in the Halsey promotional video that many of you have seen the, uh, for this exhibition, uh, that text files and, and the very the very knots of the yarns, um, the, the materials that are close to bodies, our bodies, um, are so immediate to our physical experiences that they inevitably absorb some of the essence of, um, of who we are, of, of individuals. And it seems to me that land, earth, our environments have a similar reverberating energy holding the physical experiences of humans and more than humans um, for generations upon generations. And so as a gesture of respect for ancestors and forebearers who stewarded this land before us, I'd like to offer a brief acknowledgement that we're gathered here on the ancestral lands um, that were once occupied and subsisted on by the Avisto people before they were forced out through practices of colonization practices which persist today for me and for me. And the college's formal and informal spaces reverberate with the ingenuity, the creativity, and the lived experiences of those who were enslaved and resisted that enslavement um, across those spaces. So I'd like us to recall these ancestors and forebears to honor them and their legacies, to hold space for how their reverberations, the reverberations of their lives, can have meaning for us today, particularly as we invite the possibility of these texts as a form of decolonial practice, something that, um, that we'll talk a little bit about today. So to help ground our conversations, um, and especially for the masses that are tuning in remotely, um, <laughs> who have not had an opportunity to explore this exhibition, um, I'll share just a bit about Valencia's work. Uh, and I'm drawing here from the University of Oregon uh, website where they serve as associate professor and curricular head of fibers at the University of Oregon School of Art and Design. Valencia de la Paz's work explores the intersection of textile processes, such as weaving, dye, and stitch work, as they relate to broader concerns of language, histories of colonization, migrancy, ancient technology, and speculative. Interested in the 
ways that transient or ephemeral experiences are embodied in the material, then Alas looks to how knowledge and experiences are transmitted through society and space and time, whether semiotically by language or haptically by made forms. Their current work on view here at the Halsey includes textiles designed through um, algorithmic software, which is based in code that visualized Darwin's theory of evolution in the 1950s, as well as meetings that they made with their mother and grandmother. My colleagues have graciously agreed to engage in a structured dialogue um, in the context of this spectacular exhibition are um, Christina Garcia and Sarah Schoenen. Um, we've generated several like clusters of ideas, um, of provocative ideas, that are um, <laughs> that are structured by questions that I will that I will ask, that will engage each other in the conversation and then will open the floor for uh, QA and making commentary. So I'll start by introducing my colleagues. Christina Garcia is assistant professor at the Department of Hispanic Studies and affiliate faculty in African American Studies and Latin American Studies um, programs at the college and someday in the gender studies as well. <laughs> um, her research looks at both literary and visual works from the Hispanic um, Caribbean and draws from eco feminists, post humans, post humanisms, and critical race theories. She considers how particular aesthetic techniques can solicit alternative ways of imagining the physical body and her work has appeared in edited volumes and the journals of Cuban Studies, Revista de Estudios Hispanicos, and Chesapeake. Currently, she is working on her book manuscript, Cannibal Readings and Inhuman Art, Material Ecology of the Cuban Imagination, which can only be viewed in the University of Florida Press. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and you know, as someone who uh, I have a BFA um, in studio work, I'm in my practice uh, in my undergraduate work in uh, performance and uh, video work in how to uh, mediate performance. Um, but you know, at the same time, I made objects and I'm interested in uh, sculpture. And so I think I have a, a deep appreciation for uh, the fine craft aspect of what we do here at this. Um, and that, you know, this work is aesthetically beautiful and uh, truly, you know, the work of a practice. And, um, but um, at the same time, you know, I'm deeply interested in the ways that uh, composition can, you know, support um, the creative act and can be um, both, um, you know, a means for creating art, but also sort of a co-creator to also draw on, you know, um, sort of science and technology studies perspective on, you know, how computers interact um, with humans, you know, you might think of them as a principal actor in the creation of a work like this, alongside, you know, humans like myself, um, uh, people in that type of the programmer who works on the project as well, um, you know, that all of these um, people and technologies and the, you know, actual physical um, uh, structure of the visual room that was used, I think are all contributing factors, and well, Lucio is the author of the work, obviously. Um, you know, I'm sort of, uh, he's making use of this network of tools and ideas and people um, to ultimately arrive at the visual experience. Yeah, so one of my journeys and questions, and whenever I interact with a past perfect in community, I don't know if it's driving or just a nagging question, I ask myself, how does this particular aesthetic practice, how is it implicated in our politics or ethics of the community? Um, or how might the materials, the processes, the techniques, and the composition of the particular style, right, the connection that uh, the artist or the writer is uh, making, prompt us to reimagine or reorient the way we see the world in relation to it. And so, what I talk about, I talk about aesthetics, it's not necessarily usually when you ask, like, what is this about, right? It's not the sort of properties or the stuff that you can identify and you can put your hands on, but it's the connections, right, the relationships that we create between those properties. Uh, which sometimes often gets left out of the what is this about? So that's what I'm interested in looking at and thinking about how is this, how might this provoke a different relationship in the world? And so I also want to say that you know the way that we organize and see the world um, has real material consequences. Because structures of power and social hierarchies depend on these staple um, categories and these recognizable identities. So when you uh, suggest or solicit right, a different form of organization, then you're necessarily also um, challenging these structures of power. And so Momentum's work does this for me in many, many ways. But um, one of the most immediate ways, like at the moment of perception, um, if we had no sort of uh, information right, about their process, and their process is really fascinating in and of itself and very conceptual, um, but just um, if you're anywhere as near as near sighted as I am, your eyesight is as bad as mine, and as mine, you could possibly, from a distance, right, confuse their work as um, large scale, non representative of uh, paintings. And, um, and so that right there, I think, is really provocative. And as a painting space, there's this particular series that we're looking at is a stretch, right? It's stretched on canvas, and the size and the way that they're exhibited um, definitely corresponds to a tradition of painting. Um, and so painting in the European and the U.S. imaginary is a medium that historically is equated with fine, you know, high art with the cult of the artist and the cult of the, the genius. Paintings are contemplated. Um, and so, and especially non-representational paintings or non-figurative paintings and what these were coming about in the early and mid 20th century were thought to be universal forms that would transcend specific uh, ethnic or cultural differences. Um, but of course, when you get closer, or if your eyes are better than mine, then you will see that these are in fact textiles, right? It's not um, it's not pain, it's, it's fiber. Um, and so textiles solicit, not sure we want to contemplate them, but they also solicit touch. And fibers are organic, and they're ephemeral, and as Clemenzo underscored in, in the video, right, they carry this corporeal residue, right, of those that came in contact with that fabric. Textiles also we associate um, they're utilitarian, they keep us warm, they're clothing. 
Um, and historically, again, that Euro American imaginary, they're not associated with high fine art, but crafts. Um, women's work is collectively made. In other words, it doesn't have the signature, right, of the artist. So right there, there's that maybe that expectation that one might have, right, in presenting textile as painting, um, they're playing with the system of value, right? How how we value and also in terms of that interaction, right? Well, I want to contemplate this and 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 appreciate its presumably universal forms. Um, that's not true. <laughs> They're not universal. Um, and I also I also want to touch this, right? And so that is also inviting a different um, relationship. Um, but the other thing that really relates to my work and it gets me really excited is um, I am uh, related to this question of aesthetics and how we organize the world. I'm really interested in writers and um, artists that decenter, that destabilize this pure value of the human. And so it's sort of the thing that if you take it for granted now, for most people, actually most people agree, right, the differences of gender, sexuality, of class, of race, that these are historically, socially, and culturally constituted, that they're historical constructs. But what we might um, also take for granted or not really question is that there's this ontological difference, right? We might take as a given that there's a difference between the human and the non-human. But all these social hierarchies are mapped on to this difference of the human and the non-human. And so I think that um, if we're concerned right, about all these other social justice issues, then we really need to take seriously the work of um, destabilizing the human. Um, and so we'll talk about that later a little bit more. But basically, yeah, in the intersection of technology and art, um, there is necessarily this question, right? Because art is usually associated, that's the sign of our salons of like humanity. And so what happens when you take that and you're like, actually, it could be quite uh, technological, then you're, you're questioning those, um, those distinctions. <laughs> Thank you both for um, really helping us interrogate so much more, more deeply um, what, what we're experiencing in this room from so many different perspectives, which intersect in this really beautiful, sort of magical way. Um, so you, you segue, and we started planning this, right? <laughs> you segue quite nicely because I have a query about queerness. Um, Valencia's tapestries invite us to understand the similarities, as Sarah was noting, um, which, and you as well, Christina, between weaving and coding. Right? Both the form, sorry, both the loom and the computer operate with this um, binary language, right? Zeros and ones and push cards, um, and uh, also the sort of under over weaving of the textiles. Uh, and essentially, he adapts software to create patterns on the digital loom, creating these visual spectacles that are anything but binary, like in terms of the, the um, codes and the push cards. So their work really, um, you know, as Christina, you were just saying, like their work really troubles these presumed boundaries and these presumed binaries, and that which is essentialized or naturalized instead turns into this emergent relationship that he helps that, that he explains as guided in part by his intuition right there's this, his intuition there's the machine the computer and then here it's the room right in, in the textiles so uh, they render patterns that cross mediums and boundaries um really evoking queerness in their work um so from your vantage point how do how can we see queerness in the world? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, so I guess for me first, it's like I was saying that that how at, it seems right, it, like it's almost nearly essay, and in another context, Valencia describes or maybe in the description of their work, it, it, um an alien language, right? So there's this transcription of data, right, uh, from the algorithm. So there's actual information that we could maybe unpack. I don't want to unpack it. So um, so it's this alien language, right? Um, the fact that it is illegible, right? That it's a politics, it's like it's not a recognizable politics or a recognizable identity. For me, that's already very provocative, right? That ambivalence of not being able to really sort of read this right, right away. Um, but then, of course, um, in all this dichotomy that you're mentioning, 
mentioned, right, and all the, the collapsing and the intersecting of the that means there are these ontological uh, crossings and trespassing, um, but also um, the fact that process is so important to their work, and so in process, there's necessarily transformation. There's a metamorphosis that's going on because they're um, dealing with these different technologies, right? Like some of it is stitched by hand. There's the, the computer aspect of it. There's older forms of the boom and then the more industrial room or what have you. And so there's these mediums that are getting translated and transformed. So there's a metamorphosis. Um, so to me, that all works against the idea of like a stable, recognizable identity that you can really um, compartmentalize. Um, but among, there's a sort of, there's, um, two dichotomies that I find uh, really important that they play with. And so there's the dichotomy, and you mentioned this person, your description of their work, of the, um, making the immaterial physical, like making it tangible. So we think of data, we think of all these things as existing in this immaterial world, right? And um, they're making them, they're giving them this tangibility, this three-dimensionality to it. Um, but of course, this, this uh, data, right, that this, what we imagine to be immaterial is not. It has weight. It actually occupies the space. And if you have a physicality, then you also become unpredictable. And so for me, ultimately, they're also playing with the idea that there is no ideal, right? And so it's usually when you're measured against an ideal, like an archetype or a model, that then you get, this is an aberration. This is a deviation. This is not all this. This is normative. And so when you collapse that idea of there even being an ideal, right, by insisting um, that that ideal actually has a, a physicality and a materiality. Um, and then also the dichotomy between creator and creation. You mentioned that's a lot of that sort of the potential for co authored, right? And so when you collapse that distinction between what is a tool, what is the creator, uh, what is um, the agent or the subject and something that's passive, right? And then you're absolutely um, challenging, right? Structures, structures of power. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that comes to mind for me, I guess, is um, you know obviously kind of returning to this point of uh, discussing the ways that you know the work blurs the boundary between um, you know the computer and the human hand. Um, it makes me think of sort of you know the way that some of the spirit is I know and it in particular you know has started to um, have been responsible for kind of deconstructing for us the difference you know between like, what is the cyborg what is you know our relationship to technology that extends our abilities you know what is the deep ambivalence about you know the relationship between um, the history of technology and the military for example which very much comes into play in this work. Um, as um, Rizzo uh, writes about in the description of the bio-numerical um, organisms work, the work is completely worth the key. Um, algorithms used to generate um, a simulation of single cell organisms. So this was a, um, an algorithm that was originally created, uh, a software program created by um, Bill Borselli, um, who was a computer scientist um, who made it specifically to work on um, uh, what at the time was a supercomputer, but a supercomputer that was actually uh, originally used for um, calculating the blast radius of uh, atomic bombs as part of the Manhattan Project. And then after that period, um, it became sort of open for um, people in the scientific community to use other fun projects. So, you know, uh, Hibenzi has talked about this is deeply connected to sort of this ambivalence between, you know, this destructive power and competition as, you know, a force that, um, you know, has, uh, has, you know, deeply ambivalent implications of the world, as well as, you know, something that can be used as a creative tool. And, and use as a way of simulating and thinking about the origins of the world and the origins of life. And sort of that, you know, sort of deep discomfort with those two things coming together. I think it's one of the places that I see the sort of schism. I also, you know, I think it's really fascinating about this work, the way that it really practices for us, um, you know, an act of translation. It's translating on so many different levels, but there's a transition from software to obviously, you know, these beautiful textiles. Um, but there's also a lot of translation in just making that process um, possible. So um, when Lindsay was here, we were privileged enough to get a look at actually um, the software that's used to generate um, the patterns that are woven into the textiles. And um, I was like blown away to learn that it actually uses, 
Yay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, the programmer that the DO worked with, Michael Mack, actually um, took the, the original code and then worked with the DO to um, create sort of a simulation that would simulate the three-dimensional patterns that are created on, on the weaving. Um, and then that is what is generated actually by the simulation in um, Unity 3D, which is a program used for creating video games and simulations and you know, creating worlds. Um, so just like you know, it's not as simple as thinking, oh, there's this algorithm that exists, and then you can sort of transpose it onto the fabric. Actually, there are many creative apps of taking that software, you know, making it understood by a 3D program, making that 3D program, you know, um, produce, um, you know, what will be legible then to the digital loom, and then there's the actual creative process of moving on the loom, which, you know, when we think of computational, um, uh, you know, textile tools, we might think of like. A knitting machine just like spitting out scenes of fabric, right? Or we might think of just, you know, fabric being produced by a machine. But this is a, a loop that you actually have to weave every stitch of it. Um, it just controls that you go back to the quilt, um, the threads going up and down. So it includes patterns, but you have to like physically produce the actual work. So um, so there is this fascinating connection between, you know, really collaborating physically with the computer, which I think again for is exactly. And I think also I was thinking that some of that that is in other instances he's designed the software and then allows the software to generate its own design. Yes. And he calls it computational creativity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean the software is meant to be generated, right? Mm -hmm. So the software sort of creates the conditions and you know, part of that is offered by Joe Sally originally, and then part of that is offered in the translation process. But it sort of, you know, sets up these procedural conditions and then you know, the authorship is sort of shared between how they can generate these patterns and how they can, you know, then decide what they actually want to execute into textiles. Yeah. And, you know, it seems fascinating to me, just, just picking up the thread of um, two things that you said. You know, Christina, you said that ontological trespassing that's happening and Sarah, you mentioned the acts of translation and the ways in which those cross these or clear the boundaries between Know, like this ancient craft and this ancient practice and, and what we consider to be modern day computing right, and technology yeah. um, and again sort of collapsing that is another example of clearing what reality is and that also has deep volume of implication right because when you're also contesting this idea of what we recognize as sophisticated technology right and then you're reminding that although there was always technology around, right, there's these different forms of technology and they also have their own sophistication and this presumption of like who's the society that arrived, you know, that has, you know, the, these ideas of what is advancement and progress of which one is to be Absolutely. Yeah. I think and he, he, he talks about, which I think is another component of this, um, you know, that, that he came so he was originally a painter Right. Yeah, I think he originally wanted to be a painter um, and came to painting um, at some point later with graduate work. And that in that process, he then taught their mother to um, to learn to, to do things. And then uh, their mother taught their grandmother to, to do things. So it's sort of a reversal of the generational passing down of this craft. Um, it also disrupts the sort of gender implications and expectations around that. Um, so there's, I mean, there's just so much, you know, and I feel like things have never seen this probably, but the queer aspects of everything that's happening in this, you know, in this text is really happening. So thank you for sharing more about it. Well, also just, you know, to that, um, I think it's really fascinating. We touched a little bit on the way that this works as it relates to the history of computation, but um, I think. Um, you know, one of the really fascinating things about um, Pomentio's work and Pomentio's sort of interest in um, textiles is like, you know, Pomentio goes every summer and does an immersive program with graduate students where they um, work on, I believe, a painting from the 18th century or 17th century um, loom that's essentially a recreation of the original um, desert loom. So it uses punch cards, and the students have to learn how to create punch cards, which are the original sort of binary technology used both in early computers, um, you know, to simulate ones and zeros, um, as well as use it in uh, early weaving technology um, as, you know, the, the sort of uh, automation entered into weaving. 
But I think, you know, it's again a very connected to questions about sort of power and agency, you know, because um, that, you know, the emergence of the dagger movement was very politically um, contentious at the time. You know, it's where, you know, the, um, I believe it's where the Luddite comes from, right? The, the term Luddite actually refers to people who um, tried to push back the, the artisan community, tried to push back on the imposition of this technology that they felt was going to displace them. And, Sort of lower the quality of their um, their work experience and their, their sort of power as laborers. So again, you know, this is a technology that um, that Lumenzi is embracing and sort of working with in this historical tradition that's very rich with all of these complexities and sort of you know, balances of power. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on to a slightly different topic, um, Christina. Given your interest in the non-human and the political potential in non-objectivist or non-figurative work, how do you see Valencia's work in relation to Elizabeth Fick? Um, and uh, just by way of context, Elizabeth Fick is a new roster faculty member here at the college. And her work, which is in an adjacent space to us, um, is about essentially, and I think um, paying for this language, essentially elevating the mundane to the extraordinary. Uh, and uh, aspects of performance of the self, and how bodies move through space. And so I'm wondering if you can speak about the relationship between Valencia's work and Elizabeth. Yeah, I had seen reproductions of Valencia's work and Elizabeth's work. I knew that they were going to be exhibited together, but I didn't think about it. I didn't think about the correlation at all. And then I came to the exhibit and I was like, Sorry. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. I was like, they, they just the juxtaposition because on the one hand, they're so radically different, right? So Elizabeth's work is very much like this human-centric drama, right? The human figure is in, in the foreground, whereas like Conventio's work, you might think of it like the work of this like divine technological spider, right? Um, but yet they coincide in really um, interesting ways. And so Elizabeth's work is something that I also uh, you really get to see it in person because of the proportions. So it, it, they're very large um, and uh, they're almost life size. And so when you go into the gallery, you get this feeling, I got this feeling where it's like crowded, like just full of people, right? And I was made aware of my own embodiment, right? And, and also of um, my own sort of capacity, right, to be sort of dancing in the space, because she has a background as a dancer and she's interested in, in, in movement. Um, Valencio's work uh, doesn't create that feeling of crowdedness or her body, but it also solicits embodiment, right, in, in the sort of tactileness, um, in, in that in, in touch, and in that, in that uh, potential residue that's in the cloth. But what I found also that was sort of really sort of interesting or ironic is that, so, some of the uh, Elizabeth's pieces reminded me they have this high contrast. The background is very dark, and the figure is highly, you know, like very illuminated. There's this dramatic chiaroscuro, and it reminded me of um, Spanish Baroque paintings from the Counter Reformation, where it was like they wanted to really create the illusion that this miracle can happen, the saint will appear, right? And so they're very lifelike. Um, dynamic, um, very theatrical, right? And so Elizabeth's pieces, some of them specifically, made me think of this point in European painting um, where um, they had come to really become very refined and sophisticated in creating the illusion of three dimensionality. And, you know, lo and behold, this was abandoned with the invention of photography, which is what she's using, right? She's using photography. And so this and this was, by the way, also like a technology. It was perspectival illusionism, right? It was a technique that, that was, you know, perfected with, with time and it was abandoned. And the sort of art that then the, the shift where it goes into becomes more and more abstract, more non representational, like <laughs> the, the, like Hobensio's um, the tapestries, like what they reminded me of. And so they both reminded me, they bring up these sort of key points, right? And in, in traditional European. Um, European art history, but of course, they're not painting, they're both using technologies, right? Elizabeth's using a camera, Holden's using the room and computer, um, and algorithm, uh, algorithm. So for me, what they bring up is that sort of reminder that technology has always been 
a part of art, right? It's always, and, and then I love going back to the Greek word techne, because that means um, it's the knowledge to do, to how to do something, but it also means craft, and it also means art. And so I feel like the exhibition as a whole brings us back to that connection, right? Of it sort of collapses these distinctions between craft, between art, um, between technology, and again, um, when we mess with those categories, that also has um, serious implications for um, how we imagine what is proper, right, to, to the human. Um, and then again, and then what we consider as technologically sophisticated and more advanced or less advanced. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of, I think about the references, I go in a really different direction, but I'm really excited <laughs> talking about. I think, um, you know, Relating particularly to the works that are on the center of the gallery, and I don't know what the name of that series is, but there are these grid based works, right? Where um, basically the camera has been uh, placed, <coughs> and um, Dick is taking these uh, images which are not presented chronologically, but you know, um, she's working over time to basically create this controlled um, space of the brain and then capture what sort of dynamically, organically happens in that brain. And then, you know, creates these sort of gridded works that, you know, patterns emerge out of, you know, sort of this organic process of watching life happen there, right? So to me, that's very reminiscent of, you know, um, the use of this computational process. But really what I think is fascinating is that, you know, you can, we think of, you know, procedural art, right, in a very sort of um, specific way. When we hear procedural, we think about computing specifically. Um, but, you know, artists have been using procedurality in their work going back, you know, to data, you know, the use of games and art. And, um, basically, the creation of systems where you, you know, put parameters in place and then you see how they fail, or you put parameters in place and then you see, you know, what dynamically happens. I think of, you know, things like performance art in particular, um, you know, artwork like, you know, think of like Yoko Ono's pet piece. You know, she creates a situation that she puts herself in, and it's the chaos of sort of the audience and how they interact with her that creates a different experience every time and sort of creates this body of work out of just sort of what organically happens within. You know, situation that she put in place, or even though John Cage, like, you know, four minutes and 33 seconds, like, it's again created a situation, you know, a place, a sort of uh, relationship with the audience, and then it's the sounds of the street or the incidental sounds that actually create what the experience is. So I think, you know, or, um, you know, Maria Abramovich, um, like a lot of her early work with Lisa, it was really about, like, you know, here's two giant, um, you know, plaster um, plinths or something, and we're going to do the systematic action of running back and forth between them and slamming into them and seeing, you know, what's produced by that. How does that action break down over time? That kind of action. Mm -hmm. So this like use of process, you know, goes back to so many different sort of our historical points. I feel like this is just an interesting sort of new use of that, of creating sort of a space of possibility and then seeing sort of what happens in it. You know, so I think I see that happening both in Dick's process of creating these sort of artworks, but then also. You mentioned what we're creating, you know, I mean, essentially you can think of, you know, um, uh, the act of in general is sort of procedural because you are working within this great space and it's the very thing that we create that, you know, creates the pattern. Um, but particularly with these um, computationally generated things, you know, conditions have been created by software and then they're executed and that's how the artists are produced, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for that. I feel like we should call me into the space. So, so Sarah, uh, given that much of Valencia's work with the digital boom makes use of generative algorithms to create the complex patterns that we see expressed in these very fine textiles, what do you see as the relationship between this work um, and ongoing controversies? around um, the uses and misuses of AI in realms that we previously understood as deeply human, um, specifically in visual art and in writing. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is a really uh, kind of interesting moment in time to be contemplating these works because we are all sort of saturated in this conversation. You know, there is like literally sort of an arms race going on and going on in, um, in you know, um, in Silicon Valley, we're trying to generate sort of the most powerful AI technology right now. But what I think is interesting about um, sort of the construction of the discourse around that is that it all kind of centers on people's anxieties about, you know, computers sort of replacing them and computers, um, uh, you know, exceeding our abilities, um, you know, as something that is, you know, not human, right? That there's sort of the 
we have this anxiety about being like overtaken by the AI and all these sort of sci-fi narratives that we've been fed and that are now sort of you know playing real to us. But really, you know, when I look at the products of those, all of those technologies that we were talking about, um, chat GPT, so the you know, very convincing uh, text generating tools that the chat bot that you know you can prompt to you know about write paragraphs for you or write you know an essay um, with very specific you know parameters that you can pay for it. Or if you're talking about you know stable diffusion or one of these tools for generating uh, AI art, I think sort of what unites all of that with this conversation is that you know that essentially they are sort of deeply human in what they're doing because they're completely dependent on data sets that are aggregations of sort of you know enormous swaths of human creativity and human ingenuity and human you know intellectual labor. Um, so they couldn't exist without our human contribution to them. They really are. You know, just completely a reflection of the human input that we've given into them. But we have this anxiety that you know what they're producing is alien somehow and you know not of our sort of not the same realm as us, but really, you know, they're not only an expression of um, their data sets, but also the hand of the programmers that create them, right? So they're you know they're deeply integrated into sort of you know the human ability, but they feel outside of us. So again, I mean I just I, I don't mean to be reductive, but I I keep coming back to this collapsing of the categories, right? And, and, and the ways in which, on, on a very sort of uh, figurative level, events are asking us to imagine the connectedness, right, of AI and humans, and you're inviting us to think about it that way, um, but not as threatening as the way that we think. Right. And how it's always embedded, right? That whether we want to call it human or not, but it's very much embedded in like real materiality. So when we were describing before the like, other connections that we saw with Elizabeth's work and of the sort of setting up the control, right? And you have this repetition, but then there's always this unpredictable element and there's always this variation. And there's, yeah, so if there were uh, compulsions to think about, right? How this data, this idea still often space and you're never that absolute control is really possible right that's always you know, that unpredictable element that's embedded right in, in terms of topology or lived experience mm -hmm. um so so returning to this metaphor of weaving and its relationship to narrative and writing um and given uh, your interest in text how is it that you read Valencia's work through these other tropes of the web yeah, so I, so the web, despite, of course, that weaving has historically been associated with the, with the trope of, of the spider. And so, like, two examples are you have the, the Greek uh, myth of Arachne, but then you also have in West Africa, you have Anansi, the spider, and Anansi is the, the god of storytelling, trickster, um, and a spider. <laughs> and so, you always have these relationships, right? These, these relationships between the weave. Weaving, tapestry, and writing. Um, I also want to say that for um, feminists and eco feminists, um, the model of the web is also really important because this idea that if we imagine ourselves as part of a, a, a web, right, and to harm one part of that web, no matter how distant or, distant or invisible that part of the web is, you have to recognize that ultimately you're going to be impacted, right? So the idea of the web. Um, Displaces, right? The spider's web displaces the centrality of the figure or the individual sovereign subject, right? You're always enmeshed and connected. Um, but in terms of, of writing, and I always, you know, when I teach uh, literature classes, I always try to um, make, uh, have my students think about this, this trope, right? Because when we think of writing as weaving, it becomes less, again, about the properties and more about the connections between them. Um, but Provencio's um, textiles, and, and, and text, is that text is of course connected to textile and to weaving, anyway. Um, but because they're using these algorithms and that Darwinian software that traces the evolution of these organisms, like, we can appreciate that there's actually, they're transmitting information, right? So these textiles are transmitting information, these textiles are texts, right? And you could potentially read them. Um, and maybe we'll think of information in a different way, like the history of the one that um, they did with their grandmother and their mother. So it has that, that history and that memorial of their touch embedded, right, in these texts. 
And so what I find really important about thinking about potential of a tax style as a form, as a tax, as a reading, is um, in terms of the history of colonialism in the Americas, it was uh, claimed, like part of the rhetoric or justification of the, of the colonizing project was we are bringing civilization. Well, how do you justify that when you're confronted with evidence of really sophisticated societies? So the claim was, well, they don't have writing, right? Yes, they have engineering that's amazing, they do really spectacular things, but they don't have writing. And when they weren't recognizing as writing, they were thinking of writing in a very Eurocentric sense, like the transcription of phonetic speech, right? And so um, when I teach um, introductions to Latin American and Caribbean studies with my students, one of the things that we look at is um, we look at Antian tunics and we talk and, and recognize that that tunic, if you knew how to break it down symbolically, can also be read as a tax or even the infectivu, right? Which are these strings and they're not. And up until very, very recently, they were only thought of as a mnemonic device to keep an inventory of recording. But more recently, they've been able to discover that actually the narrative is much more rich. And so if we expand our idea of what we consider writing, right, as a transmission of information, um, then that necessarily contests that that rhetoric of, of um, of I'm bringing, you know, we're bringing civilization, right? You know, there's there's good writing. We just didn't want to, you know, read it or <laughs> try to read it. <laughs> yeah, recognize it. Yeah, I've been thinking about this for like well, it was just something. It's like this textile version of, you know, um, textiles being this alternative way of transmitting information and recording history, and often, you know, histories that are suppressed. You know, it's a it's a sort of expression of that. Yeah. And, and yet, he, he, they don't reify the, the sort of ancient practice. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, as you were saying, Sarah, that there's still a very um, tactile aspect of this movement that, that this really has, literally has to put the threads through, right? Um, but there isn't a, a sort of reification or nostalgic, um, right, uh, of, of <coughs> the, this kind of practice. Um, and in fact, it, it brings in a whole technology. To challenge that. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, um, so I'd like to maybe ask, and maybe this is a question that folks um, here with us can, can also contemplate um, how we might interpret the title for this exhibition, which is The Ends of Rainbows. The Ends of Rainbows. And so, you know, Sarah was, was saying just a few minutes ago, um, I, I started during the coffee this morning and I just sort of had these thoughts and so they're half formed, half calculated, right? Um, like, might, might this be connected to this pervasive tension that we experience in today's world between the possibility for technology to solve problems and the imminent destruction that we believe technology will unleash upon us, right? And, and and you mentioned the um, chat GPT, right, and the apocalyptic claims that many uh, of us in higher education are making <laughs> about this particular software, the demise of all things educational. Um, and Hovinter really pu pushes us to imagine technology as, as intertwined with beauty and aesthetic pleasures, right, tactile pleasures that art and technology intersect. Um, so, so that's sort of my interpretation of
Um, but yeah, precisely because it's working against that something that is being manufactured or controlled going back to, to the hand and, and unpredictable and, and the embedded this material. Right, and, and, and we don't really know, or should we, like, is that messiness or is that imperfection a result of human error? Right, right. right? Like, yeah. 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 Or is yeah. it yeah. Is what the computer right. and the program produce? Right. That yeah, and then really just well away, but it draws attention to materiality itself, you know, um, for choosing to make these, you know, wall based or choosing to make these weird dimensional looking stuff, but they're pushing that number of, um, you know, what we might think of as, I don't know, some of the precision that I feel like we feel after I like, like, some of them, like, they're making the choice deliberately to sort of, you know, um, not just replicate a print, but like show the, you know, the tensile aspects of the fabric and what it's able to do that's different from, you know, um, trying to make an organized, you know, pattern based painting, right? So they, you know, they look like paintings, but then, you know, it only takes like a second of closer examination for you to see, you know, um, the material that they emerge. And I feel like maybe we just need to, you know, allow for that stretching to be visible as a, as a voice in that direction as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's working against, as you say, that sort of expertise or sort of being masterful. That's a great, I'll try to take a job that. That's a great question. I would think that it's um, maybe a dialogue that has to do um, more with responses, like effective responses, like there is, right? Like you talk about how like some of these pieces we know that there's like actual information, right? You know, in terms of the, the evolution, tracing the evolution of these organisms, but a lot of that sort of information or that history, right, has to do with with the touch, right? Um, and so it's maybe a dialogue that isn't necessarily one with words, right? It's a dialogue that really has to do with more with affect and the way that it responds and, and react to something. Yeah. I have a question that um, maybe the curator knows it, but we have to also. Since it's all about touch and tactile, are we allowed to punch them? <laughs> 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 uh, no, no. Um, but, but I think just even that urge yeah. is, is um, as part of the experience. And I don't know that that's always the case, too. In yeah. In the group of NCOs, you know, yeah. right. you know um, body of work, you know, they present the textiles in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Sometimes they're not much more loosely, and sometimes they seem like they're inviting that kind of experience with them. Yeah. But then here we see like this more deliberate choice of like placing them on the wall, which I think, you know, is gives us the visual language that they're precious and they're artworks and we don't touch them. Right? Yeah. And as you guys as you all pointed out so well, we have to actually be referencing the claim on our not our our already our structure of how we understand things that are on the wall, right? And what our relationship yeah, they had other moments where you could wear it and wear it right as well, right. or did exhibited work horizontally um, on tables, kind of recalling the domestic function uh, of textiles, is what we think of as the original textiles. Yeah, now there was an exhibit I saw that it was, a, and they called it like an archive, and I think it was like a collection of different um, yeah. like textiles, and they were hanging, and then so you could pick one up and wear it around the gallery. Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, they kind of embody this in ways that, that they talk about the, the reality that's embedded in just the, the, the textile, right? Like the not to be art, even like the ways in which the fabric interacts with the right? And then by the other people, right? A lot of other people. <laughs> Wait, and remind me of this often. Do they have like a 
collaboration that involves streetwear. Like, I feel like I saw something. Oh, I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit surprised because they're so, it didn't seem really push me around their hands. Right, right. And they're in a department where, you know, the students are, some of them I think are working on a conceptual fine art level, and some of them are working on a more, you know, on textiles in a way that will connect them more to their industry. So, but I feel like I, I feel like we encountered that at some point. Um, and really to it, which is exciting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, on what they do, I should have mentioned they do have an artist talk on February 25th at 2 p.m. Um, so we can ask them. Yes, we can. We'll come all really prepared. <laughs> yeah. Be like, did you bring us up to wear? <laughs> Thank you both so much for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and um, working with my um, naivete on all of this and just helping me and I'm sure many of our colleagues and friends here um, really appreciate this work in many, many different ways. It's just, um, I'm thinking it's a terrible pun, but it's textured and you help us 